CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is not a new disease. Actually, the concept has been around since 1928 when Harrison Martlin first described changes in boxes that he saw. And he described this affliction punch drunk syndrome. And ever since then, the name has kind of undergone different changes. So it used to be called dementia pugilistica, uh, chronic traumatic progressive encephalopathy. And then it kind of settled on chronic traumatic encephalopathy by a researcher named Dr. Bennett Omalu. And this was interesting because he found what was thought to really only exist in individuals like boxers or people who really uh, endured multiple traumatic brain injuries, he found this very interesting pathology in a football player, in an American football player. And it was shocking, to say the least. And it was really brought forward by another researcher named Dr. Anne McKee. And she started to find more and more evidence of this type of pathology. And this pathology in general is based around the protein tau, or hypophosphorylated tau. And they found that it had a very specific pattern of deposition. So for example, in Alzheimer's disease, we find one pattern of tau deposition. But in CTE, we find a very specific, peculiar deposition that's focused around the vasculature. So it's around blood vessels, it's at the base of the sulcus, it's near the ependema, near the peel surface and we're seeing it in astrocytes and we're seeing it in neurons. And so we're seeing this kind of peculiar pathology that kind of pops up in these football players. Now what's interesting is that the clinical syndrome of CTE isn't necessarily unique. It has lots of different types of symptoms, so it can often be mistaken for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or even ALS. So the reason why this is so important and also so shocking is because we thought some of these people, some of these footballers, some of these boxers, some of these, these American footballers, they just had Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. But it turns out what's actually happening is they're suffering from this disorder or this disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, that their brain is undergoing different changes. And the reason that they're experiencing these symptoms is because of this tau in their brain. So why it's important for us to kind of talk about this is because we don't know why CT occurs. We have no idea how it even comes to be. But what we do know is that it's associated with repeated mild traumatic brain injury and that possibly the more brain trauma you get, the more likely you are to develop CTE. Now, this is important obviously for anyone who's playing sports or for anyone who's had brain injuries. And I'd like to exercise caution because not everyone is going to develop CTE. Not everyone who gets in the head is going to develop a neurological disorder. But what we are saying is that if people now understand the risks that are associated with something that they thought was innocuous as playing football, then they might understand what might actually come about. Now, what's also really important that we should kind of stress is the fact that CTE doesn't occur in everyone. Most of these boxers or footballers or individuals who've participated in contact sport, they don't always develop CTE. So perhaps we're seeing individuals with uh, a predisposition or a likelihood to develop this disease. And I think some of the research and what's really important is trying to understand why certain people develop CTE and why others don't. So, Within chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the disease presents in two different ways. One, macroscopic changes in the brain, and two, microscopic changes in the brain. Macroscopically, what we see is a general loss of tissue, which is called atrophy. As you can see here, that the cell side and the tissue becomes a bit more entrenched, so we're seeing loss of cells. Another thing we're seeing is this thinning of this connector here called the corpus callosum. You can see how it's incredibly thin compared to this guy over here. These are both sufferers from CT. The cavum in the septum pellucidum, as you can see right there, which is the thin bit of tissue which separates the two ventricles. Now what else is important is that actually the ventricles themselves are incredibly dilatated. We're seeing them much, much, much larger than they should be. And this together with kind of reduction of the um, or atrophy of the mammillary bodies, we're seeing this as the macroscopic changes or the macroscopic features of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. However, as important as these features are, these aren't diagnostic. 
So you cannot use these features to diagnose CTE. The only way that we can actually diagnose CTE is by looking microscopically at hypophosphorylated tau deposition. So more into the macroscopic features. As a comparison, we have a brain with chronic traumatic encephalopathy and a normal box's brain. What we're seeing here is clearly the enlargement of the ventricle, uh, ventri lateral ventricles is very apparent here in the case of CTE, as well as the thinning of the connector between the two hemispheres, the corpus callosum. And this is quite apparent in here in these two cases. So, like I said, in CTE, you have two types of changes. You have macroscopic changes and microscopic changes. Within microscopic changes, it's very important to focus on certain proteins. For example, we look at hypophosphorylated tau, amyloid beta, and TDP43. But what makes CTE unique is the presence of hypophosphorylated tau. And it's not necessarily that hypophosphorylated tau is there because it's in loads of other disorders like Alzheimer's um, and cortical basal degeneration and progressive supranuclear palsy. But what makes CTE unique is this location and the fact that you have tau in both astrocytes and in neurons. And this location at the base of the cortical sulci, around small blood vessels, in both astrocytes and neurons, is the pathognomonic lesion. It's what makes CTE CTE. But there's also these supportive features like um, thorny shaped astrocytes or, or uh, tau and astrocytes in the peel surface or in, um, around vessels within the cortex or in the white matter that kind of gives CTE kind of more support for what we're seeing rather than just pathognomonic lesion. But what's interesting about the supportive features is that we also see them in other disorders. So for example, there's a disorder called aging-related tau astrogliopathy, or RTAG. And this disorder shares very similar tau pathology to CTE. And so what we're trying to do is to understand the difference between RTAG, which is predominantly found in astrocytes, and CTE, which is found in both astrocytes and in neurons, and try to tease out the differences and the similarities between them. So my work with Box of Brains basically focuses around a very peculiar collection called the Corsalis Collection. And the work that we're doing is we're taking archival tissue. So this is tissue that has been collected in the 40s and 50s, and we've been sitting in formalin since then. And what we're trying to do is look at these classic cases of what was then called dementia pugilistica. And we're trying to understand, does dementia pugilistica have any relationship to CTE? And it does. And we're trying to understand the kind of mechanism behind how the pathology develops within these boxes. So we have the wet tissue, so it means we actually have the actual brains of these boxes. And we're able to dissect the tissue and do multiple immunohistochemical techniques and experiments to further understand the underlying pathology. Some of the work actually that we're doing with the boxes has illuminated something, some really important facts. One, that we are finding these classic um, kind of pathologies like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but we also see CTE. That what's interesting about CTE, what I've described before, is the actual lesion or the pathognomonic lesion which you have to have in order to diagnose CTE, we have this pathology and we have this pathognomonic lesion in some of our boxes some of our other boxes, we actually find that they don't quite meet this diagnostic criteria, but they come very close. So, of course, this criteria is preliminary, so therefore it's been introduced as more of a talking point for us to understand and build upon. So we're seeing that individuals have some of the supportive features and they don't have the pathognomonic lesion. And some of them, they'll have the pathognomonic lesion with all the supporting features. So it allows us to understand what pathology is important to diagnose CTE and what pathology is important to understand the disorder. So the Corsellus collection is a really unique collection of human tissue. It's an amazing collection because it doesn't confine itself by one or two neurological disorders. It was created by Nick Corsellus, who wanted to be able to understand and have a place for collecting all sorts of neuropathological disorders, or disorders that had no neuropathological basis. Because at the time, it was the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, in which 
we really didn't understand very much about the brain. What was so unique about Corsellas is that he collected individuals who, uh, he collected brains of individuals who were, were boxers, who had committed suicide, people who had dementia, uh, people who um, kind of uh, fell in front of trains, and he wanted to understand if there was a neuropathological basis that underpinned these clinical syndromes. He was the first kind of explorer of, of kind of neuropathology. And what was really exciting, especially for CTE, is that in 1973 he wrote an article called The Aftermath of Boxing, in which he took 15 boxes from the Corsellis collection that we actually have today that we're working on, and he did an analysis. Um, a screening, if you will, of the neuropathology, of what was actually changing in the brains. And what he found basically were these generalized changes across all 15 cases, all 15 boxes. He found ventricular dilatation, he found thinning of the corpus callosum, he found the presence of neurofibrillary tangles and senile plaques. And a lot of this pathology that he actually discovered in the 70s still has its place in the pathology that we see today in CTE. So we still use some of his initial findings as not necessarily diagnostic criteria, but supportive criteria for what actually CTE is.